Okay, so um, today's talk is um, about um, the titles from Idea to Mainnet, um, Obstacles for Founders, and mainly together with the title, um, it's also a little outline of what we do at the Interchain Builders Program. Um, so a little agenda overview for today is, yeah, we'll talk about these mentioned obstacles. Um, we'll talk about how the program actually supports teams um, through different tracks. And we'll talk about who the teams are we're supporting, who we are, and of course, a call to action. Um, before that, a little bit about myself. I'm Steph. I'm the lead of the Interchain Builders program. Um, I've started um, with an Interchain, building out the program and structuring it from the ground up, end of 2021, up to launch, um, and now working out of Binary Builders on the Builders program. My background on that before is I used to study art, run an art gallery and a tech unrelated startup, and now I'm happy to be in the space um, since almost two years. So, um, yeah, building a chain is um, very exciting at the start. Um, you might, you know, you're a developer, you might uh, have an idea, you um, are already in the space, you're using different uh, networks, and you kind of realize, oh, there's like something that's needed, and something that needs to be built, and that you're excited about building. Um, so all of a sudden you see yourself, you're like, okay, yeah, we're building a chain, but leading up to, to the actual mainnet launch, um, which means you know, you're launching a token, um, there's a lot of obstacles and a lot of things that might cause you a lot of anxiety and a lot of things that a lot of young founders, especially coming from the technical sides of things, um, might not be aware of um, at all. Um, which again is why we're here and I'll, I'll dive into some of those um, topics. Um, the first one, um, so yeah, most topics is specifically what we've been seeing with teams. So the first one is the actual pitch. Um, again, we're starting from the start. You've been developing for, you know, a couple months. Um, you realize in order to continue this, you need to raise some funds. So first of all, um, you need to put your product into an actual pitch. You need to explain it to people and you should have a full outline. So the whole question, of course, is what actually makes a compelling pitch? Um, the pitch usually starts with, of course, there is a problem, there is a solution, but then is um, what is actually the most important thing about this narrative that is often left out um, is, of course, why is this actually a problem that's worth solving, right? Like anybody can make up a lot of problems in the space, um, but then are, are these solutions actually needed? Are there actually people um, that, that, yeah, that need them? Um, a second point here is um, another mistake um, in general, but especially also in these pitches, is um, a lot of teams have an idea for a token, um, how this token um, will be distributed, why it's needed in the network for security and whatnot. But the whole question that is often missing is what is the actual business model around this token? How does it accrue value? Um, what is the actual um, um, value flow um, overall? And some of these things that we're talking, um, I'm talking here about right now is in the current stages or in the current um, sentiment, also in terms of um, what investors are seeing. It might have been possible um, to go to investor two years ago during a bull market and say, hey, we're building a product, we don't have a business model yet, but we are working on it. Um, but right now, um, most investors do want to see this um, laid out and at least like that there has been a model or some thought put into it. Um, another point is token incentives, yes. Um, but then who are the actual customers? And this is another point that is often missing um, or that teams at these early stages haven't really thought of yet because again, you know, you're concentrating on the product, but these are points you shouldn't be leaving out. Also together with the actual go-to-market strategy, um, you know, okay, you do have now an idea of who your customers are or who your earlier customers are, um, but how, what are the tactics in which you actually get to them? And lastly, and um, again, like why these are important, is um, within these pitches, the most important part is also who is the team as um, yeah, a pitch is as much as it's a pitch, it's also a um, job interview to the investors um, who do ask who is your team. Oftentimes it's um, 
a lot of devs, you know, a lot of technical people who have an idea for a product as they know the networks, um, but what, they, what, what they're often lacking is like, sure, there's the technical side, but there also needs to be the business and the marketing side, which is why um, a lot of investors do want to see a team that has the full scope. Um, so yeah, um, that's the first, um, the first obstacle, the, the pitch in itself, um, which of course combines a lot from the business model to the go-to-market strategy. Um, a second early on obstacle that teams might run into are the actual fundraising instruments. Um, why are they important? It's because at the early stages, um, you might, it's easy to already make some um, bigger mistakes that might have um, huge implications on actual projects trajectory. So the question is, um, or sometimes the question is not which fundraising instrument to use. Um, the common ones we know are okay, <coughs> that teams are familiar with or that are be being used right now in the space are safes um, plus a token warrant or a token side letter. Um, oftentimes teams might not exactly know the difference between the two. Um, and another really common instrument that people are aware of or that people, young founders might know in the space are SAF, simple agreements for future tokens, but kind of what um, isn't in the common know-how is like what these fundraising instruments might imply on, um, on the future. Um, such as with both token and warrants and SAFs, um, teams might tend to actually put a price on their token at the very early stages of their development, meaning the founding team signs the agreements, put down, puts down a number such as you know, 20 cents, 50 cents for a token, it puts down the number of tokens that exist, um, but there's what, what are the actual effects um, when doing so. Um, I'll touch on this a, bit, a little bit later, um, but this is something that needs to be considered. Another um, consideration, of course, is which documents are suitable for which jurisdictions. Um, if you're a US team, um, what do you sign? If you're a European-based team, what do you sign? And of course, wait, what legal structure is actually needed? Your developer company should not be able, should not be signing agreements for future tokens where you are already pre-selling tokens, um, but rather raise via um, safes. Um, on the other hand, what legal structure is needed if your US company signed a token warrant um, and so on. So there's again, uh, what I want to point out here is what are all the things that you need to be thinking about without giving all the answers um, today, of course. Um, next, really fun topic that every founder, um, especially from the technical side, will probably you know, want to like, bump their head against the wall is um, the incorporation structure that, that you know, structuring or that you will have to set up leading up to mainnet launch. Um, with the common questions, I'll just like touch on it briefly is, so what entities are needed? How many are needed? Um, what are they for? Why do you need them? What are their tasks? Um, when do you set them up specifically? And again, back to the last topic, how do these um, different entities actually correlate with fundraising and why are they important? Um, I'll just give a really uh, simplified version um, of the different entity types, jurisdiction, the development phases, um, how it correlates with fundraising and its tasks. Just to give you a brief idea, this is specifically, um, as mentioned, for US teams, as again, it differs according to the different jurisdictions. Um, so the first step, uh, most commonly, is setting up a developer company for the US teams. This is, tends to be a Delaware C Corp, um, where the team starts the centralized development of the project and usually raising the pre-seed and seed rounds, and in this case, signing a save and a token warrant. A uh, specific task, yeah, it's signing the, the docs, um, potential advisory agreements, NDAs, um, and so on. And of course, it gives a general structure for like um, employees. Um, in this certain setup, which again is correlated to the fundraising and the token warrant, um, a team would need a token SPV. Um, a special vehicle company, token special vehicle company that um, is basically, I'll touch on it briefly, that will be mainly um, responsible for converting the token warrants into 
into um, the actual tokens. Why is this important? Because in the case of the US company, your US developer company should by no means have anything to do with the actual token distribution. So um, it's actually, yeah, it, it takes care of this it, and it converts the warrants and distributes all the tokens to the investors, to the team members, again, avoiding any tokens touching or being related to the developer company. And the last um, step in this case is the actual foundation, um, which is set up for launch usually, um, and which needs to be set up post launch. Um, in terms of fundraising, at this stage there isn't usually any fundraising, it's more, if anything, liquidity acquisition for the network, um, token sale agreements, OTC de deals, and so on. There's again, also in terms of foundation, there's different ways to set this up. This could be more centralized, um, a structure with a foundation council that will make decisions. The foundation could also be the um, legal DAO wrapper with a um, DAO constitution. And again, they could then sign like OTC agreements, brand agreements, service agreements with the developer company. So this is just a really simplified version of how this all looks. Um, and now as the last point, um, I'll touch on general decentralization, which is a really important point for teams to have in mind. Um, <coughs> as they are building a decentralized network, the question is what are actually like some of the most important steps to make sure that the network is decentralized. Um, as I already touched on, and again, you will see everything is intertwined and correlated, um, starting really from the early stages of fundraising, is of course, um, don't price the token. This is um, especially important in terms when, if, if the regulators do look at it, um, which again, they will if a project will be successful, um, is not pricing the token because the moment a founder puts an actual number on a token, it implies that there has already been some centralized control over this token, um, implying that, um, yeah, the centralized control by the founders um, making all of this up, basically. Um, another part of pricing the token um, I didn't mention earlier on is, of course, also tax implications when launching the token that has a price. Um, these, pri these tokens will hit founders' wallets, advisor, or anybody else's, or people's, some people's stakeholders' wallets with a certain price, which is then correlated to a certain fiat value, uh, which th certain individuals will have to pay taxes on, which is a token that might not be liquid at this point. Um, so again, that's why this is important. Um, another part here I'll just touch on briefly, of course, is a well-balanced token distribution um, for equal voting power um, and also in terms of delegations of the tokens that should be considered quite early to make sure you know, no one foundation holds too much voting power, um, too much of the tokens, one individual, whether it's investors, team members, that could um, imply to any regulators that there is a um, majority of voting control in the same parties of interest. Um, another way to do this is, of course, um, distributing this voting power is where um, the tool of airdrops comes in again, um, other than marketing and, and um, um, yeah, just to distribute tokens to the general public, but to really also be able to get governance going from the get-go, basically starting with early proposals such as um, where we come to the next crucial point is um, decentralized secondary market creation as um, no founders at any point um, to really, you know, for the network to be seen as decentralized should be associated, no founders, no, um, no DEFCO or no um, core contributing company that created the network should be affili affiliated with any um, secondary market creation nor um, the marketing around it. So ideally, a secondary market could be um, created in a decentralized way by um, a governance proposal where it is proposed to the community. It's a mere suggestion to create an, you know, liquidity bootstrapping pool from the community pool, from like a dedicated pool that is um, set up or that is in place for secondary market creation, but that the community then votes on. Um, and it's a decentralized decision by, by the community. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a roundup on the decentralization. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm also done with the main 
um, obstacles for founders. So again, it's mainly like things to watch out for um, that you might not be aware of otherwise. So to round this up, so how does the Builders Program support teams actually? We do this at this point um, through three different tracks, which I'll touch on in the next slide. So our preliminary track still being the um, accelerator track, accelerator track and where we support Cosmos builders to launch and beyond, meaning we support teams using the Cosmos stack, um, building their chain from fundraising to their legal strategy, through technical support, token design, go-to-market strategy, and of course, um, we help them with our wide network and partnerships. Um, Whereas the orientation track, um, we figured out we've been getting a, a lot of inbound from teams, um, from other ecosystems, from teams, other ecosystems, from teams who are still orientating around the stack, um, the ecosystem being quite decentralized and, and hard to navigate sometimes. So we do help them also with, on the technical side. Um, we're starting to build out migration strategies for the teams who want to migrate um, alongside the network and partnership sites that we try to provide them with. And lastly, the integration track uh, for teams who just want to connect to Cosmos in, t in general. Um, and or integrate IVC, so it's similar, the technical support, ecosystem navigation, and of course, partnerships. Um, alongside all this, um, we're also creating our internal knowledge base, um, the Knowledge Hub, where we provide teams with best practices um, around technical topics, around the fundraising topics, everything uh, I just mentioned in, in the obstacles, um, alongside with some helpful overview of different grants programs and so on that all the teams have um, access to and that will also be um, open, open to the public. Um, yeah, then the last cohort that we just announced, um, we're really proud to be working with are the following eight teams. Um, and some of the previous, yeah, you can see them so I don't need to read, um, read them out. Um, previous teams we, we've worked with are um, some of these, Yieldmos, Cal, Gitopia, Squid, um, Paloma, Source. Um, also in terms of the program structure, um, the idea is to support teams on an ongoing basis, as you know, many teams do come into the program. They're in the process of fundraising. Fundraising closing around easily takes three to four months. Um, but then of course, you know, half a year down the line, they might need actual support on, on the mainnet launch or something else. So we do want to make sure we're still around um, and don't offboard the teams after their three months of closing their round and then it's um, goodbye. So it's the program is long, it's made for longevity and for a long-term partnership um, between us and the teams. Um, lastly, on who we are and where the Builders program is operated, it's out of Binary Builders, um, which is also home of the Cosmos SDK and Numia. Um, and also runs a validator, and we're proudly funded and supported by the Interchain Foundation. So that's it. Apply now at join.builders, follow us on Twitter, or reach out via email if you'd like to. So about the funding of the foundation, right? Does it fund your operation, or does it also invest in the... It funds our operation. Um, it's a public, so the Interchain Builders program is a public good for the ecosystem supporting teams. So we do provide the hands-on held experience um, to support teams. Um, in terms of fundraising, again, we help teams with the pitch deck. We have um, a network of investors with whom we then share the teams, but nor the Interchain Foundation or we are doing any investments in the teams. Exactly. So yep, that's it. Thank you.